If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 2. Hebrews, chapter 2, going to talk about why did God become a man. Hebrews, chapter 2, uh, while you're finding your way there, just want to remind you that Christmas Eve, we will be here at 4.30 and 6 p.m. Uh, the 4.30 service is going to be very full, so uh, we advise that you come a little bit early if you're coming to that service. We will start at 4.30 sharp, not 4.30 dull, so uh, we hope you'll come and join us. Uh, 4.30, 6 p.m., the services will be about one hour in duration, uh, beautiful candlelight services, and if you're here in town for Christmas, we hope that you'll come and be with us. And then New Year's Eve, we're changing things up a little bit this year. Last year on New Year's Eve, we had the biggest overflow crowd that we've ever had. We had people uh, in rooms all over the building trying to watch on television. So we have added a second service for New Year's Eve. So we will be meeting at 4.30 and 6 p.m. on New Year's Eve. We'll have communion together. And the Lord has given me a great, great word for the new year. I can't wait to share it with you. And so hope you'll join us on New Year's Eve to just welcome the new year and everything good the Lord is going to do in 2016. Thank you for all your giving towards phase two. Thank you for your prayers. Um, we have one week left for you to give uh, in this calendar year in 2015. And if you're able to share a gift with us before the end of the year, it would be a tremendous help to us. We have about $1.4 million left to come in. Uh, that has been pledged to the Jump In Capital campaign. And we need all of that money to come in, and we need a little bit more than that to finish phase two in the coming year. And so uh, if you're able to do something right now, between now and December 31st, it would be a tremendous help to us, and we thank you so much. Hebrews chapter two, would look with me in verse five, and let's talk about why did God become a man? Hebrews two, and reading in verse five, the Bible says, it is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come about which we're speaking. But there is a place where someone has testified, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and put everything under his feet. In putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered, both the priest who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers in the assembly. I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he may break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. Let's pray and let's invite the Holy Spirit to come minister to us. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people that you love so much. Thank you for your presence with us and your powerful word. Your word is truth. Father, I pray that we would encounter you through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, we just say amen, amen. and amen. <clears throat> well, one of our favorite shows in the Harvison household is American Ninja Warriors. I don't know whether you've ever had the pleasure, but a group of super fit athletes compete to finish a series of outrageously difficult obstacle courses. That's uh, actually Joe Morofsky hanging upside down there. He's from Fairfield, Connecticut. He's a weatherman here in Connecticut. And uh, we like to sit with the kids. I like to dream about what might have been. And uh, the kids, <laughs> kids like to dream about what might be. But each time the athletes advance to another level, 
the pack gets smaller and smaller and the obstacles get more and more difficult. Inevitably, a new obstacle is introduced and it seems just impossible to cross. Athlete after athlete will fall off of that obstacle. Out of 30 competitors, 15 or more might fall one after the other, and you find yourself wondering whether anyone will get across. But then one athlete finally makes it through. And after one makes it through, then another makes it through, and another makes it through. All it takes is for one to get through, and the rest see that it can be done, and they see how it's done. After six years on television this year, the first man ever made it all the way through all the courses and won the competition. And after one man made it through, another man made it through even faster than the first. You know, that's a really good picture of what Jesus Christ has done for us in the incarnation and in the cross. Jesus was the first man to ever successfully conquer this crazy obstacle course that we call life on earth. He showed us that it can be done. He showed us what winning looks like. He showed us how it's done. And he uniquely makes it possible for us to become conquerors too. In the 11th century, St. Anselm of Canterbury posed the question, why did God become a man? It's a question so big that it's answered a few different ways in the New Testament and in the words of Jesus. During this Christmas season, we've been exploring this question together. First, we saw that God became a man to cry with us. Last week, we saw that God became a man to bring heaven down to earth. Today, I want to talk about how God became a man to lead fallen humanity to victory. For quite some time, my Christmas messages have focused on the truth that Jesus came to earth to show us what the Father is like. John wrote, no man has seen God at any time, but God, the one and only who was at the Father's side, that is Jesus, has come to earth and made him known to us. Jesus explains God to us. He expands our understanding. He interprets God. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Hebrews 1 says, the Son radiates to us the exact representation of the Father's being. We could say it this way, Jesus is God's selfie. But today, I want to add a new thought on top of that. Jesus came not only to show us what God is like, but Jesus came to show us what men are supposed to be like and what we can be like through him. Jesus became a human and came to earth to be the first American ninja warrior, as it were. He came to su successfully navigate this wild obstacle course of life on earth so that we can too. Looking back at Hebrews 2, let's think again about that quote from Psalm 8. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you visit him? You made him a little lower than the angels crowned him with glory and honor, and put everything under his feet. Psalm 8 shows us what was God's original intention for mankind. God's original intent was glory and honor, rather than the shameful behavior that we see today. God's original intent was for mankind to be in firm control of all of creation and of human society. God's original intent was for mankind to keep evil subjugated under his feet. God's original intent was order and harmony and security and abundance for man to flourish in every way that mankind can. But Hebrews tells us that that is not what we presently see. Yet at present we do not see everything subject to him. In fact, if you haven't noticed, the obstacle course seems to be getting wilder and wilder out there. But then Hebrews tells us that we have a champion who has indeed conquered the course and has fulfilled Psalm 8. 
At present, we do not see everything subject to him, but we do see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for a little while, but who is now crowned with glory and honor. Without ceasing to be God in any regard, God became a man. John wrote, the word became flesh and pitched his tent among us. God became one of us. God moved into our neighborhood. God became fully human and he attained that crown of glory and honor that no man had ever before received. And so he opened the way for the rest of us. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10 says that humanity now has a trailblazer. If you're acquainted with the old King James Bible, you might recall that the translation here in Hebrews 2.10 calls Jesus the captain of our salvation. That that word translated captain means a hero. In Isaiah 9, it says of Jesus that his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. The mighty God is El Gabor in Hebrew, and it means a superhero. Auntie Roe, I owe an apology to the Ukraine missions team. They did such a great job leading kids ministry in Ukraine this last summer, but I got to tell you the truth. I thought to myself, if I have to hear that Jesus, you're my superhero song one more time. But actually, I want you to know that it's very biblical. In both Testaments of the Bible, Jesus is called the superhero of our salvation. Another way to translate that word is pioneer or even better, trailblazer. Jesus has gone ahead of us where no man has ever gone before and he has successfully cut a path for us to follow him to attain that crown of glory that God intended for us. Why did God become a man to lead fallen humanity to victory? Looking at Hebrews chapter 2, I see six ways that Jesus leads us to victory, and I want to share them with you genuinely quickly this morning. Six ways that Jesus leads us to victory. First of all, Jesus has blazed the trail to sonship. C.S. Lewis said, The Son of God became a man to enable men to become the sons of God. Hebrews says that our trailblazer has brought many sons to glory. Jesus modeled for us what a life of perfect human sonship looks like, and then he made sonship possible for us by his sacrifice on the cross. Listen, if anyone has ever doubted the value that God places on human life, the incarnation settles that question once and for all. Beloved, listen to this. God, for whom and through whom all things exist, has willed it that among the vast spectrum of his created beings, there should be human beings. God has willed it that in all of creation, we alone should be made in his image. God has willed it that we should have physical bodies fashioned from the dust of the earth. He has willed it that for a little while we should be a little lower than the angels and later exalted above the angels. God has willed it that we alone should share a unique relationship of intimacy with him, something that surpasses what anything else in all of creation will ever experience. God has willed it that from among all of his created beings, he should share a portion of his own glory with us. Do you know that's why the devil hates us so badly? The glory that he craved and he tried to steal from God, God has determined that he is going to share with us. Those ideas are communicated by the word sonship. Ladies, we don't mean to be gender exclusive. We don't mean to be gender insensitive by using the word sonship. But the Bible uses that word very deliberately and with a great weight of meaning. And hey, if I can be a bride of Christ in one part of scripture, you can be a son of God in this scripture. 
Sons include both male and female believers in Jesus, and it designates the place of highest favor, of highest honor, of highest authority, of highest intimacy. How much does our God value human life? He has willed for us and us alone the highest, most intimate place by his side for all of eternity. And when we forfeited that through sin and we faced a future of eternal death, God himself became a human to come to our rescue. Beloved, let this thought sink into you. God has done for us what he never did for the angels or any other created being. For surely it is not angels he helps, but he helps us. The incarnation is the ultimate statement of the value that God places on us. God was unwilling to let us go. He was unwilling to forgo his purpose in creating us. He was unwilling that there should be no human beings in his eternal kingdom. He was unwilling to lose out on that intimate fellowship that he looked forward to sharing with us. He was unwilling to share his glory with anyone but us and he was unwilling not to share his glory with us if God loves and values human life that much then I suppose we ought to value it too we ought to value our own lives you ought to value your body God loves your body so much that he put on a body to come save your body We ought to value the lives of others. We ought to value black lives. Black lives matter. And blue lives matter. All lives matter. We ought to value unborn lives. We ought to value handicapped lives and bruised lives. We ought to vigorously defend the sanctity of life with the highest possible standards. Paul wrote to the Corinthians that once he realized that Christ came and died for all, he said he would never undervalue any human life again. God valued human life so much that he himself became a human in order to rescue humanity. God valued human life so much that he identified fully with our sinful humanity. Though he himself never sinned, he took upon himself the penalty for our sin. On the cross, Jesus tasted death for everyone. On the cross, he offered himself as the only sacrifice that could make atonement for the sins of the people. On the cross, he rendered powerless the devil who held us captive all our lives. Jesus' sacrifice removed the offense of sin that alienated us from the Father. And so he has opened the way for our relationship with the Father to be restored. He has blazed the trail for us to become sons of God. You know, if you sit and reflect on that a little bit, it is an awesome thought. Even as an old man, John the Beloved still couldn't get over it. He wrote, what? kind of love is this that we should be called the sons of God six ways that Jesus leads us to victory Jesus has blazed the trail to sonship and second Jesus has blazed the trail to a life of spirit filled worship Jesus showed us what a true worshiper of God looks like on earth you might remember that along the way Jesus met a woman at a well who was following a false religion. She was enamored by holy patriarchs and holy places and holy artifacts and holy rituals. Jesus said to her, ma'am, religion is done. The time is coming and now is that the Father is seeking worshipers in spirit and in truth. Jesus modeled that kind of worship for us. Jesus showed us that worship is experiencing and celebrating the presence of God anywhere, any time of day, every day. 
And as we experience and as we celebrate his presence, we receive more and more revelation of who God is. We understand his character and his nature more and more. We understand his ways more and more. We become more and more convinced in our spirit about him. Jesus lived continuously in the presence of God. Whether he was in the temple or on a mountain, whether he was at work or at dinner with friends or out fishing, and we can live in God's presence too. Hebrews 2 verse 12 puts a quote in Jesus' mouth from Psalm 22, 22. I will declare your name to my brothers. In the presence of the congregation, I will sing your praises. To declare God's name means to communicate all that God is. It means to reveal all of God's goodness. It means to disclose all of God's beautiful virtues. When Moses begged to see God's glory, God replied, Moses, I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will proclaim my name in your presence. To those who have entered into brotherhood with Jesus by faith, to those who have become members of the worldwide assembly of God's people, Jesus declares God's name to us. Jesus reveals the Father to our hearts. He deeply impresses on our hearts that God is good all the time. He deeply impresses on our hearts that God is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry, abounding in love and faithful to a thousand generations of those who love and worship him. Jesus deeply impresses on our heart that our Father is beautifully righteous and perfect in all of his ways to us. Have you ever had someone say to you, you know, I just don't understand how you can be so into God. I'm just not into God like that. Well, the reason that you're so into God is because Jesus has been pouring revelation into you as you've been worshiping him. And not only are we convinced about God's goodness in our minds, but we actually experience his goodness in a very personal way. We experience his love. We experience his compassion. We experience his forgiveness, his peace, his security, his joy. Jesus said, Father, I have manifested your name to the ones that you have given me. In other words, Jesus said, Father, to the ones that you have given me, I have caused them to experience experience everything beautiful that you are. That's good preaching right there. I just made myself happy with that one. Now Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that means when we gather here together for worship, Jesus is still in the ministry of declaring and manifesting God's name to us. As we sing praises together, Jesus actually becomes our worship leader. I'm so thankful for Pastor Jason and worship uh, and Elizabeth and our worship team. They do an amazing job. But I want to tell you, Jesus is the real worship leader in this place. And as we worship, Jesus causes all God's goodness to pass in front of us. He pronounces God's name to us. He manifests God's name to us and convinces us of all the beautiful things that God is and causes us to experience those things in a very personal way. Maybe when you come here to worship, you notice that a lot more people are more into it than you and you wish that you could experience what they're experiencing. Why not simply ask Jesus, our trailblazer, to lead you into a deeper experience of spirit-filled worship? Six ways Jesus has led us to victory. He's blazed the trail to sonship and spirit-filled worship. Third, Jesus has blazed the trail to a set-apart life on earth. Peter wrote, Christ has left you an example so that you should follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. As a fully human man, Jesus showed us that it really is possible to live set apart for God. And he showed us what that looks like. And he also made it possible for us to live set apart too. 
Because of his atoning sacrifice on the cross, Hebrews 2.11 says that Jesus, our high priest, has consecrated us. He has made us holy. That word holy, that word consecrated, it means set apart for God's use. In the Old Testament, if a person was dedicated to God's service, that person would be washed in a special way and anointed with oil and then set aside exclusively for God's purposes. And that's what Jesus has done to we who are believers in him. Through faith in his cross, our sins have been washed away. The Holy Spirit has come and has anointed our hearts. And now we are set aside exclusively for God's purposes. Now, that doesn't mean that we stop living in this world. Doesn't mean that we stop working and raising families and enjoying friends. But we don't live like everyone else. And we don't live like we used to. Others might pursue wealth and power in an idolatrous way, but we don't. Others might pursue leisure or pleasure in an idolatrous way, but we don't. Others might engage in drunkenness and sexual impurity, but we don't. Now, in American Ninja Warriors, some of the obstacles are infinitely harder than others. And so it is with living set apart for God. It is infinitely more difficult than something like, say, worship. But Jesus showed us as a human that it is possible to do with God's help. And we have here a very precious promise that he will give us special help in the moments that we need it. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to give real help to us when we are being tempted. In American Ninja Warriors, all the other athletes can do is cheer for their colleagues when they're up on the obstacles. But Jesus, our superhero, does something far better than that. He actually gets on the obstacles with us and he gives us a boost of his strength so that we can live set apart like he did. Six ways that Jesus leads us to victory. He's blazed the trail to sonship, spirit-filled worship, a set-apart life. Number four, Jesus has blazed the trail to a life of faith. The truth of the incarnation is that Jesus was 100% God and 100% man, the unique God-man. He is the one and only of his kind. There has never been another one like him, and there never shall be. Although he retained his divine powers of omniscience and omnipotence and omnipresence, Jesus submitted the exercise of those powers to the Father while he was here on earth. That's what Paul means in Philippians 2 when he writes that Jesus emptied himself. As Jesus passed from infancy to childhood to adolescence to adulthood, Jesus navigated life precisely the same way that we do by relying on God. Hebrews 2.13 puts another quote in Jesus' mouth. It comes from Isaiah 8 and verse 17. I will put my trust in him. Actually, if you go to Isaiah 8.17, the whole verse says, I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from me. I will put my trust in him. On the cross for one awful moment, the father hid his face from the Son. But even in the face of death, Jesus trusted the Father more than ever. It was the culmination of an entire life lived in faith. Because of that, Hebrews 2.14 says that Jesus has blazed the trail for us to live in faith rather than fear. By his death, he destroyed him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and freed those who were held captive by fear all of their lives. From the cradle to the grave, we can trust that God is going to help us every step of the journey. We can trust that God will guide us. We can trust that God will provide for us. Listen, if God can't provide enough to build phase two, then he's not a good God at all. He is more than able. We can trust that God will protect us. We can trust that absolutely nothing will befall us beyond what God permits. And even when we can't see his face, 
even when it seems like he's not there, even when we don't understand his plan, still we put our trust in him. God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Therefore, we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not live in fear. What can man do to me? Six ways that Jesus leads us to victory. Sonship, spirit-filled worship, a set-apart life, a life of faith. Number five, Jesus has blazed the trail to a life of service. Hebrews 2.17 says that Jesus became a high priest in service to God. The way that Jesus served God on earth was by serving others. And he told us to do the same. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he wrapped an apron around his waist and he took a basin of water and he washed the disciples' feet. Jesus said to them, I have set an example for you that you should do as I have done. How can we serve like Jesus did? Jesus is our great high priest in service to God and we have been called in him a royal priesthood on the earth. We serve by praying for people. I don't mean saying, oh, I'll keep you in my prayers. I mean actually taking them by the hand and praying for them. We serve by administering the gifts of the Holy Spirit to people. Word of knowledge and word of wisdom. Gifts of healing and workings of miracles. You know, when you wake up in the morning, you ought to ask the Lord, Lord, show me throughout the day, who can I bless today? Who can I touch today? Lord, give me eyes like Jesus to see what you're doing and what you're saying. Lord, use me in the things of the Spirit to bring heaven on earth to people around me today. I was talking to an executive, a major, major company executive on Thursday, and uh, uh, he led a woman to Christ at an office Christmas party. She's in tears simply because he offered to take her hand and say a pro word of prayer with her. We serve people by leading them into encounters with God's presence, by leading them into the experience of God's forgiveness. Beloved, can I tell you, it was never enough for Jesus only to minister to people's symptoms. Jesus always addressed the root cause of people's problems, which is sin. Whether it's poverty or sickness or addiction or family dysfunction, we serve like Jesus by addressing the root and leading people to the forgiveness and the freedom that comes through the cross of Jesus Christ. Six ways that Jesus leads us in victory. Sonship, spirit-filled worship, a set-apart life, a life of faith, a life of service, and finally this. Jesus has blazed the trail to eternal life. I'm going to ask the worship team to come and help me. Jesus has blazed the trail to eternal life. After running the whole gauntlet of obstacles, the final event in American Ninja Warriors is a climb straight up a 75-foot rope, eight stories high. Up until this year, no one had ever made it all the way to the end of the course. No one had ever gotten to try the final climb. But after one broke through... Another followed right on his heels. Without ceasing to be God in any regard, Jesus became fully a human being and he ran the obstacle course of life on earth. He was the first man to ever perfectly finish the course and then he made the climb back up to heaven in a body of glorified human flesh. Jesus was the first man to ever enter heaven in a body and that's why Paul calls him the first fruits of those who have risen from the dead and in doing so he opened the door for many sons to follow to glory Hebrews 2.10 says that our trailblazer is leading us to a final destination called glory Glory is the completion of the transforming work that God began on, in us on earth. Glory is to occupy that place of honor and authority that God designed for us and is described in Psalm 8. Glory is an intimate relationship with God unlike anything that any other created being will ever have. 
Glory is to receive the portion of God's own glory that he determined to share with us and that he sacrificed so much so that we could receive. Why did God become a man to lead humanity to victory? In just a moment, we're going to worship one more time. But I want to leave you with something from the English pastor, J.B. Phillips. Some of you might be familiar with the J.B. Phillips translation of the New Testament. And while J.B. Phillips was in a London bomb shelter hiding from a German blitzkrieg, he wrote this little piece called The Visited Planet. I want to ask my wife, Denise, if she'll come and she's going to read for us The Visited Planet. Would you welcome her while she comes? Good morning. Once upon a time, a very young angel was being shown around the splendors and glories of the universe by a senior and experienced angel. To tell the truth, the little angel was beginning to be tired and a little bored. He had been shown whirling galaxies and blazing suns infinite distances in the deathly cold of interstellar space. And to his mind, there seemed to be an awful lot of it all. Finally, he was shown the galaxy of which our planetary system is but a small part. As the two of them drew near to the star, which we call our sun, and to its circling planets, the senior angel pointed to a small and rather insignificant sphere turning very slowly on its axis. It looked as dull as a dirty tennis ball to the little angel, whose mind was filled with the size and glory of what he had just seen. I want you to watch that one particularly, said the senior angel, pointing with his finger. Well, it looks very small and rather dirty to me. What's special about that one? That is the visited planet. Visited? You don't mean visited by. Indeed I do. That ball, which I have no doubt looks to you small and insignificant and not perhaps over clean, has been visited by our own Prince of Glory. And at those words, he bowed his head reverently. But how? Do you mean that our great and glorious prince, with all these wonders and splendors of his creation, and millions more that I'm sure I haven't seen yet, went down in person to this fifth-rate little ball? Why should he do a thing like that? It isn't for us to question his whys except that I must point out to you that he is not impressed by size and numbers as you seem to be, but that he really went, I know, and all of us in heaven who know anything know that. As to why he became one of them, how else do you suppose he could visit them? The little angel's face wrinkled in disgust. Do you mean to tell me that he stooped so low as to become one of those creeping, crawling creatures of that floating ball? I do, and I don't think he would like you to call them creeping, crawling creatures in that tone of voice. For as strange as it may seem to us, he loves them. He went down to visit them, to lift them up, to become like him. The little angel looked blank. Such a thought was almost beyond his comprehension. Close your eyes for a moment, and we will go back in what they call time. While the little angel's eyes were closed and the two of them moved nearer to the spinning ball, it stopped its spinning, spun backwards quite fast for a while, and then slowly resumed its usual rotation. Now look. And as the little angel did, as he was told, there appeared here and there on the dull surface of the globe little flashes of light, some merely momentary and some persisting for quite a time. Well, what am I seeing now? 
you are watching this little world as it was some thousands of years ago. Every flash and glow of light that you see is something of the Father's knowledge and wisdom breaking into the minds and the hearts of people who live upon the earth. Not many, you see, can hear his voice or understand what he says, even though he is speaking gently and quietly to them all the time. Why are they so blind and deaf and stupid? It is not for us to judge them. We who live in the splendor have no idea what it is like to live in the dark. We hear the music and the voice like the sound of many waters every day of our lives. But to them, well, there is much darkness and much noise and much distraction upon the earth. Only a few who are quiet and humble and wise hear his voice. But watch, for in a moment you will see something truly wonderful. The earth went on turning and circling round the sun, and then, quite suddenly, in the upper half of the globe, there appeared a light, tiny but so bright in its intensity that both the angels hid their eyes. I think I can guess. That was the visit, wasn't it? Yes, that was the visit. The light himself went down there and lived among them. But in a moment, and you will be able to tell that even with your eyes closed, the light will go out. But why? Could he not bear their darkness and stupidity? Did he have to return here? No, it wasn't that. They failed to recognize him for who he was, or at least only a handful knew him. For the most part, they preferred their darkness to his light, and in the end, they killed him. The fools, the crazy fools, they don't deserve. Neither you, nor I, nor any other angel knows why they were so foolish and so wicked nor can we say what they deserve or don't deserve. But the fact remains, they killed our Prince of Glory while he was man among them. And that, I suppose, was the end. I see the whole earth has gone black and dark. All right, I won't judge them, but surely that is all they could expect. Wait, we are still far from the end of the story of the visited planet. Watch now but be ready to cover your eyes again. In utter blackness, the earth turned round three times, and then there blazed with unbearable radiance a point of light. What now? They killed him all right, but he conquered death. The thing most of them dread and fear all their lives, he broke and conquered. He rose again, and few of them, a few of them saw him, and from then on became his utterly devoted slaves. Thank God for that. Amen. Open your eyes now. The dazzling light has gone. The prince has returned to his home of light. But watch the earth now. As they looked, in place of the dazzling light, there was a bright glow which throbbed and pulsated. And then, as the earth turned, many times little points of light spread out. A few flickered and died, but for the most part, the lights burned steadily. And as they continued to watch, in many parts of the globe, there was a glow over many areas. You see what is happening? The bright glow is the company of loyal men and women he left behind. And with his help, they spread the glow, and now lights begin to shine all over the earth. Yes, yes, but how does it end? Will the little lights join up with each other? Will it all be light as it is in heaven? We simply don't know. It is in the Father's hands. Sometimes it is agony to watch and sometimes it is joy unspeakable. The end is not yet, but now I am sure you can see why this little ball is so important. He has visited it. 
He is working out his plan upon it. Yes, I see, though I don't understand. I shall never forget that this is the visited planet. Merry Christmas, Harvest Time. Would you stand to your feet? Would you give Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, a great big praise? praise.